Welcome to the Go Run Podcast with your host, Anusha Tringi and Taskin Arisha. Tune in as we learn more about those who are affected by childhood cancer, gather perspectives of different therapy techniques, and help others find comfort in their expertise. In this episode, we'll explain how clinical trials work and why they're so essential in the fight against childhood cancer. We'll explore the different phases of clinical trials, discuss the ethical considerations involved, and highlight some of the most promising current trials specifically aimed at pediatric cancers. Whether you're a parent considering a clinical trial for your child, a healthcare professional, or someone who's simply interested in medical research, this episode is for you. Join us as we understand the vital role of clinical trials in advancing childhood cancer treatment. So, can- Clinical trials are research studies performed in people that are aimed at evaluating a medical, surgical, or behavioral intervention. They are the primary way that researchers find out if a new treatment, like a new drug or diet or medical device, for example, a pacemaker, is safe and effective in people. The purpose of it is for, especially the main ones, is determining whether new treatments or interventions are safe and effective, finding better ways to prevent, screen for, diagnose, or treat diseases, and improving the quality of life for people with chronic illnesses. So there are different phases of the clinical trial, which is phase one, two, three, and four. So phase one is trials that test an experimental treatment on small groups of people like 20 to 80 for the first time to evaluate its safety, determining a safe dosage range, and identifying side effects. Then there's phase two which is another experimental treatment given to a larger group of people, so 100 to 300, to see if it's effective and to further evaluate its safety. Now, as you can imagine, phase three is a treatment given to an even larger group of people, 1,000 to 3,000, to confirm its effectiveness, monitor side effects, and compare it to commonly used treatments, as well as collect information that will allow the treatment to be used safely. Now, for phase four, these studies are done after the treatment has been marketed to gather information on the treatment's effects in various populations and any side effects associated with long-term use. How are they designed and conducted? So in terms of designing, these clinical trials are designed with a specific protocol that includes the study's objectives, the criteria for participant selection, the schedule of tests, procedures, medications, and dosages, and the length of the study. As for conducting it, they are conducted in phases starting with small groups, like I mentioned, to assess safety and gradually increasing the number of participants to evaluate efficacy and monitor side effects. Trials are often randomized and controlled in order to reduce bias. And so it's also important to understand how these clinical trials are designed and conducted. And so sometimes they are randomized. Uh, Participants are randomly assigned to different treatment groups um, and this eliminates selection bias and it ensures the reliability of results. And then there's also blinded studies and this includes single blind where participants do not know whether they are receiving the treatment or placebo. And there's also double blind, which means the participants and the researchers are unaware of who received the treatment or placebo and it minimizes bias from both sides. And there's also a placebo control trial where participants receive either the experimental treatment or placebo, and it helps determine the treatment's actual effectiveness by comparing it to no active treatment. And then there's also protocol development, and this involves a detailed plan that outlines the trial's objectives, designs, um, statistical considerations, and organization. And it also includes like the dosages, duration, and assessment methods. Um, And oftentimes, Participants are recruited by um, eligibility criteria, and so this can be multiple factors. This can include age, gender, disease type, stage treatment history, um, and there also has to be informed consent. Um, And there also has to be continuous assessment of participants to ensure their safety and well-being. And then um, data that is stored has to maintain integrity and um, accuracy. And so what is the importance of these clinical trials in childhood cancer? So um, the development of new therapies, um, clinical uh, trials have helped in introducing new therapies that have improved survival rates and quality of life for cancer uh, children with cancer. 
And um, sometimes they may focus on targeted therapies that attack cancer cells with fewer side effects. Um, and then also it optimizes existing treatments um, by determining the most effective dosages, combinations, and schedules, and overall just increases survival rates. And so the example of a specific uh, breakthroughs achieved through clinical trials um, includes um, acute um, lymphoblastic uh, leukemia, and this has led to the development of combination chemotherapy regimes, and it results in a significant increase in survival rates. Um, there's also um, trials that have been done um, in cases of neuroblastoma, and also retinoblastoma, which we talked about before. And through these clinical therapies, they have been able to target um, tumors and the uh, delivery of drugs to the tumors and preserve vision and reducing um, side effects. And then the current landscape of clinical trials, um, there's active trials going on. Numerous ongoing trials um, are investigating new treatments and combinations of therapies. Um, there has also been a lot of collaboration. Um, it's essential for pooling resources, expertise, and patient uh, populations. And trials have been increasingly focused on personalized medicine and utilizing genetic and molecular profiling to tailor treatments to individual patient cancer um, side effects and outcomes. Of course, with any new technology emerging, there are ethical considerations to be considered in the pediatric clinical trial. First of all, ensuring the safety and well-being of our children, which is the number one most important thing. So risk-benefit analysis are extra protections which are required for a pediatric trial, including a thorough risk-benefit analysis to ensure that the potential benefits justify any risk. There is obviously minimi minimizing invasiveness, which are efforts made to minimize invasive procedures and incorporate child-friendly study design and ongoing monitoring, which is continuous safety monitoring with strict stopping rules if adverse events occur. Of course, there is informed consent, consent process and the role of the parent and guardians in this process. A comprehensive explanation must be done by the study's purpose for a detailed explanation, procedures, risks, and potential benefits. And there's also voluntary participation, which is the emphasis on the voluntary nature of participation and the right to withdraw at any time. And finally, there is child assent, which is in addition to parental consent, age appropriate assent from the child is obtained when it is possible. Another eth ethical consideration is regulatory oversight, which is FDA regulations, institutional review boards, and Patriotic Research Equity Act. So the FDA regulation is specific regulations by the FDA for pediatric research, ensuring additional protections for children. There are institutional review boards, which review and approve clinical trial protocols to ensure ethical standards and participant safety. And then there is Patriotic Research Equity Act, which mandates that drug companies study their products in children if the drugs are likely to be used in children. So, so how, do you sorry. want to do this? Guy? Um, are you up to segment four or? Yeah, because this was pretty short. Okay, yeah, yeah, that's fine. Okay. So let's say that you or your child for pediatric cancer want to find and participate in clinical trials. So there are a lot of resources to find these clinical trials in the first place. Some of them are clinicaltrials.gov, which is a comprehensive database of publicly and privately funded clinical studies conducted around the world. There is National Cancer Institute, which provides a clinical trial search tool specifically for cancer studies. There is a children's oncology group, which offers information on clinical trials for pediatric cancers. And then there's patient advocacy organizations, which is organizations like Alex's Lemonade Stand Foundation, which offers trial navigators to help families find suitable clinical trials. In terms of eligibility and enrollment process, there are usually criteria each trial has with specific inclusion and exclusion criteria that participants must meet. There are screening tests, which are potential participants have to undergo them in order to confirm eligibility. 
informed consent, which is a process that involves explaining the study in detail to the parents and guardians and obtaining their consent, and baseline baseline assessments, which is participants undergo baseline assessments and medical history reviews before starting the trial. Now, there is, of course, considerations for the parents and families when considering participating in these clinical trials. There's the benefits versus risks. So parents need to weigh the potential benefits and risks of these participations against the risk. Time and logistics. Now, really consider your time commitment and logistical challenges such as travel and time off work or school. Financial implications. Understand what costs are covered by the trial and what excesses might be out of pocket. Support services like availability of support services such as social work and psychological support can be very crucial. And so there are some common challenges that are faced in conducting um, clinical trials. Um, one problem is being able to enroll enough participants to achieve statistical significant results. And this can be challenging, um, particularly for rare cancers. Um, and being able to have these participants throughout the entirety of the trial is also critical. Um, there's also like a lot of ethical concerns that we talked about previously. Um, so being able to balance that need for scientific advancements with ethical, eth ethical um, obligations to protect vulnerable populations um, requires careful consideration. And then being able to secure adequate um, amount of funding and um, resources for pediatric clinical trials can be difficult. Oftentimes, they do rely on public funding, charitable organizations, and partnerships with pharmaceutical companies. And so um, the focus on innovative treatments and therapies being tested right now are immune immunotherapy, which involves um, uh, CART cell therapy, and it reprograms a patient's immune cells to attack cancer cells. Um, there's also targeted therapies, and so they target um, specific genetic mutations or molecular pathways that are involved in cancer growth, and so it offers a more precise and effective op option with fewer side effects. And then there's also gene therapy, where researchers are investigating the potential of a gene therapy and correcting genetic defects or um, that may cause or contribute to cancer. And so the impact of these trials on future cancer um, treatments involves improved outcomes. So successful clinical trials lead to new treatments that improve survival rates and they reduce side effects and enhance the quality of life for children with cancer. And then um, it allows for ongoing trials contribute to be able to contribute to the development of personalized medicine which can be tailored to the genetic and molecular um, makeup of each patient. And then it just improves the overall standard of care. It offers better treatment options and better future therapies. And so in terms of the future direction and hopes for new treatment from ongoing trials, we do have advanced technologies. And so emerging technologies such as CRISPR um, for gene editing and um, liquid biopsies um, for non-invasive monitoring. Um, are expected to um, help cancer treatment and management. And then there has also been increased international collaboration, which has helped to um, enhance the ability to conduct a lot of these trials and share data and develop treatments that are accessible to children worldwide. Um, and researchers are not only just focusing on treatment options, but also preventive measures. And this includes early detection and interventions that may reduce the likelihood of children developing cancer or being able to detect it earlier on. And then it just provides more holistic approaches. And so um, it doesn't just address um, cancer, but addresses the overall well-being of the child. And this includes mental health, nutrition, and supportive care. As we delve deeper into the stories and experiences of these remarkable children and their families, you might be wondering how you can turn your empathy into action. If you've been moved by the stories we've shared today, 
and want to make a positive impact in the lives of the children battling cancer. Me, Cancer Kids First, a nonprofit organization driven by the vision of improving the childhood experience of young cancer patients. Led by now college freshman Olivia Zhang, Cancer Kids First is on a mission to bring smiles and hope to these brave warriors. Are you wondering how you can join this heartfelt movement and contribute to their cause? Here's your chance. Through volunteer efforts, donations, fundraising, and the very creation of the podcast you're listening to, the dedicated individuals at Cancer Kids First work tirelessly to make a meaningful difference. If you're eager to become a part of this journey, visit www.cancerkidsfirst.org slash get dash involved to explore the ways you can get engaged. But that's not all. By tuning into the Gold Ribbon Podcast and following us on Instagram and TikTok at the Gold Ribbon Podcast and Twitter at TGR underscore on air, you will be showing your support in a unique and impactful way. We're also just an email away at the Gold Ribbon Podcast at gmail.com, eagerly waiting to connect with you. And mark your calendars because our episodes come out twice a month, ensuring a consistent dose of inspiration and insight. Remember, every action, big or small, can contribute to brighter childhoods for these young cancer fighters. So let's unite, make a difference, and be a part of the journey with Cancer Kids First. Thank you for joining us on this episode of the Gold Room Podcast. We're always eager to hear your thoughts and ideas for future episodes. Feel free to explore the link in our Instagram bio to contribute and get involved. Thank you for listening, and until next time, take care and be well.